much. I appreciate the introduction and welcome to everybody who's taking time out of their busy schedule to join us today. There are a lot of things going on in the world of finance, especially now with the in in Inflation Reduction Act that's kicking in. Uh, and so we're going to be talking about that as well during today's talk, today's presentation, but just superficially. Uh, my name is Neil Zobler. I'm the president of Catalyst Financial Group. We've been arranging financing and working with electric and gas utilities, the Environmental Protection Agency, and Energy Star, and uh, DOE for many, many years, over 20 years. Uh, we've worked with over 40 electric and gas utilities in order to set up different financing programs. So uh, we'll be sharing some of our experiences that came out of those working relationships with Catalyst Financial. So today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the pros and cons of eight different financing options. Talk about loans, leases, uh, tax exempt lease purchase agreements, power purchase agreements, energy performance contracts, energy service agreements, PACE, of course. Uh, but the new part of today's presentation, we're going to be drilling down just a little bit on the Inflation Reduction Act's uh, 179D tax deductions. There's some really exciting changes that uh, the IRA is introducing into the marketplace, and I'm just going to hit some of those highlights. I also wish to go over three Energy Star financing tools and a list of resources that you can click on once you get your slide copies. And uh, there is a, a one of those tools that we developed and, and jointly with uh, Catalyst and uh, and and uh, Kudret. Uh, is the cash flow opportunity calculator. And I want to show you how you could use that to calculate the cost of delay, which is something that everybody talks about, but very few people really know how to calculate it. And this tool will assist you in doing, making that cal calculation. So we need to cover first things first, of course. And uh, when we start talking about financing, a snapshot as to what's going in the market today, uh, the installations continue to be delayed, and that's caused by staffing shortages. Uh, hard to get people to work today. And of course, the supply chain, while it's gotten much better, it's still slowing things down. There are increased costs due to inflation. That's impacting the product costs as well as labor costs. And the higher interest rate is a real uh, squeeze on getting a lot of these projects financed to ensure that you can use the savings that are being generated by the installation to cover the cost of financing. Uh, and of course, uh, the lagging, lagging uh, utility rates tends to allow us to have fewer savings dollars in our calculations, which translates into needing longer financing terms to ensure that, that the savings, in fact, do cover all of the cost of doing the project and again, IRA, very important, and I'll talk about that in just a sec. But before deciding on how you want to finance your project, uh, you need to understand uh, some of the structure of the, the and the benefits of the different financing vehicles and do a very careful self-analysis, self-evaluation, so you understand how to best fit your project to a financing structure. Uh, so the first thing you need to do, of course, is to get an energy assistant assessment from a qualified service provider because different technologies uh, lend themselves to alternative financing solutions. Uh, so uh, it's guess best to get a clear understanding of what's the best path to go down, and we'll drill down on that in just a few minutes. You want to define short long-term business goals. Of course, if you own your property, you can make long-term investments, but if you're le leasing, when, is, when does your lease expire? So uh, how do you want to put that information into your calculations? Is your organization growing? Do you get to do a reorganization? Are things pretty static? And of course, you need to forecast future cash flow needs. Uh, you also need to understand your financial profile. I mean, how would a traditional lender score you? Are you going to qualify? Uh, there are different financing structures and vehicles that are a little easier to get, obtain financing under than others, you know, the more traditional bank criteria. And uh, does your organization have any limitations on your ability to enter into new debt? And you would find that 
under any banking relationships that may contain some conflicting covenants uh, in, in any bank debt. And of course, you need to fully explore all possible incentives before you start looking at structuring financing. That starts with your local utility benefits, local, state, and federal government tax benefits, and we'll give you some links as to how you can drill down into that on this slide. So where do you start? The place to start is your, your state energy office. Uh, this is especially true now under the IRA because the IRA is asking the states to set up the mechanisms and the criteria that's needed in order to qualify for some of these loan programs. So the feds are giving the money to the states and the states are setting up uh, the process. So definitely that should be one of your first stops when you're looking for money. Uh, NASIO has a wonderful state energy loan map that you can click on your state and it will bring you directly to your state energy office. And from there you can drill on down to find out more about what might be available through your state energy office. Uh, there's a second place which is highly effective which is ZeriUSA.org. It's a database of state incentives for renewables and energy efficiency. It's managed by the North Carolina State University, and uh, it's constantly updated. They cover everything, including local utility, local government, state government, and federal incentives. So that's really a very powerful resource. Uh, so. If you understand and you start looking at some of those opportunities that will help guide you when you're thinking about alternative financing structures. So this is a new slide and I, before I drill down on some of the Infl Inflation Reduction Act benefits, there are three really giant takeaways that kick out from the, the this, this current interpretation of the IRA. Number one, direct pay option for tax exempt organizations. This did not exist before. When an org a tax exempt organization was enabled or, or, or tax benefits were provided to a tax exempt organization because they do not pay taxes, they could not utilize that at all. That is no longer the case. Uh, they've also created an opportunity to transfer tax credits and monetize alternative options like uh, the, the uh, 179D deduction that you may be able to take. So before, if you couldn't use it, uh, it became uh, kind of moot, especially when you're dealing with public sector organizations that couldn't use it at all. And of course, there's some new tax credits for te technologies that were not mentioned before. And I'm not gonna drill down on that because that would require a whole presentation on its own. So let's start with the 179D tax deduction. It expands that deduction for uh, architects, engineers, building design build contractors and other designers of tax exempt for tax exempt buildings. So this means that you know, government and nonprofits now can uh, capture that deduction and assign it over to people who help them design their program. Uh, now that is not a tax credit, that is a deduction. That's a very important distinction to make. Tax credit is used to offset any tax payments that you have to make. Tax deduction reduces the earnings that you have so that the amount of taxes that you pay is less, it's lower. Uh, so it also expanded it for building owners for both commercial and multifamily. You can now, if you uh, are a building owner for residential property that has more than four stories, you can now qualify for some of these benefits. Uh, REITs, a real estate, uh, investment trusts uh, were also limited the way they could utilize some of these tax benefits that has since been modified. The benefit starts now at 50 cents per square foot for energy savings, but you need to have a savings of at least 25%, and that will go up to $1 per square foot if you hit 50% savings on a sliding scale. Now, one of the big changes here is that it is now uh, based on energy use intensity and the old ways of, of capturing this, you could look at, you know, the three distinct areas, which would be lighting, uh, heating, air conditioning, and uh, envelope measures, and you could qualify for part of the uh, of the deduction if you qualified any under one of any one of those three. That's no longer the case. 
Now they're looking at the whole building itself. That's a very holistic approach. And they're looking at overall energy use intensity, EUI, uh, rather than the individual, uh, uh, as I had mentioned just now. So the requirement for an energy simulation model on retrofits has been removed. That's really a big positive step forward because the simulation was creating a lot of slowdown and a red tape, obviously. We're happy to say that the Energy Star Portfolio Manager can be used to calculate energy use intensity. So if you're not already an Energy Star partner or, or you're aware of the uh, Portfolio Manager, I would urge you to sign up for one of the webinars that uh, EPA and Energy Star is running on Portfolio Manager because it's becoming an increasingly important part of how to utilize uh, the benefits or capture the benefits under the IRA. Very quick look at the, oh, I'm sorry, let me back up here for a sec. Uh, I forgot about the bonus. So the, the, here, five time bonus. So while you can get 50 cents per square foot, uh, if you're uh, not using prevailing wage and apprentice requirements, if you do meet prevailing wage and wage and apprentice requirements, uh, which means if you have uh, four employees, for example, uh, one of them has to be an apprentice, uh, but if you do meet that criteria, you capture the bonus, which is multiplying your benefit by five. So instead of 50 cents, uh, you, you bump it up times five, five times a dollar is five dollars. So that is a very interesting uh, bump and opportunity to increase those benefits. Section 48, investment tax credits, ITC, those credits can be used to offset any payment that you need to make. Uh, typically, 6% was the starting point for most of the cost, the base rate for energy property, and that can be scaled up to 30% of the cost, again, the bonus rate, and that ties it into prevailing wages. Uh, so that's a very important incentive to uh, uh, make sure that people are being paid according to prevailing wages in your area. Uh, there are some webs there's a website from the Department of Labor that you can drill down to and find out what the rate is in your particular area. If your area is not shown, you need to look at other areas around you and you can request a, uh, a special rate by sending an email to the Department of Labor. Uh, Micro turbines are limited to 2% versus everything else was 6%. And uh, again, if you meet the bonus rate, you can get up, increase it up to 10%. Uh, you can transfer the credits to third parties. So companies that have little or no tax liabilities that could typically not benefit from tax credits, uh, like REITs, now they have the option to transfer credits to another taxpaying entity who can use them. And uh, what's happening is we're beginning to see that there are some uh, brokering entities that are beginning to appear on the horizon that could put match uh, people with tax credits to organizations that can use the tax credits. And the investment tax credit it may be refundable for tax exempt entities. This is a huge benefit, huge. Why? Because as I had mentioned before, you don't pay tax, you don't get the benefit. They'll write a check and send a check directly to the organization that qualifies for the ITC. Very quick mention on the 45L new energy efficient home tax credits. Uh, they extended the rules through 2032. It's uh, new homes certified under the Energy Star programs are now eligible for a $2,500 tax credit. For dwelling units certified under the zero energy ready homes program, credit is increased to 5,000. And uh, if the, uh, uh, the multifamily units now are have a have a different opportunity here. The ones that meet prevailing wage requirements again that becomes a really important driver. And most of these programs can receive an increased uh, credit from five hundred dollars to twenty five hundred dollars and five thousand dollars for the uh, zero energy ready homes. Green banks are also picked up under the uh, IRA, and they are 
uh, mission-driven institutions that use innovative financing to accelerate the transition transition to clean energy and fight climate change. And that's a quote taken directly from the Coalition of Green Hat Capital. So if you're looking to find a, a green bank in your area, Coalition for Green Capital is a good starting point. Uh, just do a Google search on them and they will point you to uh, banks that may be already set up and functioning in your area, in your state. It uses public capital to motivate, motivate uh, mobilize private investment. Uh, there are 23 green banks currently in 17 states in DC, and uh, the Inflation Reduction Act provides $27 million of grants for EPA to establish greenhouse gas reduction, a greenhouse gas reduction fund. Uh, that again, you need to go through your state energy offices. Uh, there is a national green bank network that's being established, which I had mentioned up above. And it's focused on enabling low income disadvantaged communities to take more advantage of some of the energy savings through uh, some of these uh, rebates and, and deductions. Uh, the infrastructure investment tax jobs, uh, which happened a while ago, $23.4 billion federal state partnership, and it's designed to provide low cost financing to communities uh, for water quality infrastructure. Uh, so it includes wastewater. Uh, you see the list of, of opportunities here. Uh, and certainly, uh, if you're looking for financing, the state revolving loan funds for water and wastewater is a great place to look. Now we're going to jump into some of the financing alternatives for energy efficiency projects. And I do want to re remind you that when we talk about financing structures, I'm not talking about the source of funding. We just went through some of the sources of funding through some of the state and local and federal programs, uh, local utilities, they could be providing the money. The structure is how do you, how do you structure the repayment of those monies or the monies that are being used to finance your project? It's a little different. So here is a little map of alternative structures divided between traditional and specialized. Obviously, if you're using internal funding, you don't need to finance. If you're using a bond issue, you can add the cost of these improvements to your existing bond issue, uh, which would exclude the need to use any of these alternative structures. So let me back, go back to traditional. We've got leases. There are two different commercial type leases, type A and type B, used to be called capital lease or an operating lease uh, or a tax exempt or lease purchase financing. Uh, these are done at lower interest rates because uh, the qualifying entities uh, do not have to pay federal income tax uh, on, on the loans and the, the lenders will reflect that in the lower pricing. Under loans, of course, consumer loans, commercial loans, and equipment financing agreements. Uh, you'll, I'm finding that a lot of the uh, funding organizations are using EFAs, equipment financing agreements, more so than loans. Uh, excuse me, more so than leases these days because of changes that were made and the way you have to account for leasing. Let's take a quick look at the specialized. Uh, solar lease is a unique animal. You can see it has a little electric sign there uh, that refers it to being uh, designed for mostly renewable energy projects. Uh, they are very unique and need to be uh, negotiated, looked at individually. Of course, loans, I divide them into, uh, you know, your traditional loans versus the utility uh, on bill financing or, or on bill recovery uh, programs that are put together through your local utility. The difference between OBF financing and OBR recovery is the source of the money. In some cases, the utilities are using their own money. In the other cases, they're working with a lender, a third party lender, and they're servicing the loan through the utility, which is very convenient if that's up an opportunity for you to take advantage of. Of course, there are specialty funded funders who are very familiar with the alternative structures that you have. So, for example, if you're looking for uh, the case of an energy service agreement, uh, an energy as a service type agreement, there are lenders who will fund those specific types of projects. So let's go over to PACE. I'm going to only talk about commercial PACE, at least reference it. Energy services, there are a variety of them uh, on, under the structures here. Uh, energy performance contract, traditional energy service agreement, uh, managed energy uh, services agreement, energy as a service, and MSS and ESS, EAASs 
are very similar. I could almost put them in the same category. And PPAs, power purchase agreements, again, PPA is very popular uh, for using uh, with uh, renewable energy projects. I'm not going to talk about cash. We all know that cash is easy. The only problem spending the cash is that you no longer have the cash available to you to use for other projects. And when you're looking at approving, getting approval for uh, capital projects, uh, I hate to say it, but uh, you know, energy efficiency is not always the sexiest project on the on the books because sometimes it takes longer to recover your benefit according to traditional guidelines that most large corporations have set up. For example, it's got to have a payback of three years or less. Well, energy efficiency is unique because when they're properly structured, you can use the savings to pay for the improvements. So it's kind of a cake. You can have your cake and eat it too kind of a project. And we'll get into that in just towards the end of today's presentation. I'm not going to talk about loans because I'm sure everybody on the call today has at one point or another in their lives have taken a loan. Uh, benefits of, of the loans is uh, if you have an investment tax credit, uh, that can be captured by the borrower, the loan, and it's typically uh, the lowest cost borrowing because uh, you wind up, uh, if you're using a, a traditional bank loan, for example, you may wind up uh, committing the, the corporations or the entity's total resources uh, to reimbursing that loan. So it's you know full faith and credit or hell or high water language that they put into the loan agreements, meaning that uh, you have to pay it and, and, uh, at the expense of, of going into default and then risking other loans that you may have uh, outstanding with a particular lender. Uh, again, it, uh, it competes against other capital projects. If you're with your energy projects, uh, it also has restrictive covenants, and that's an important mentioned here, and I did allude to it earlier on, uh, and restrictive covenant is one of when you sign a very common that the bank is going to require you to submit financial statements on an ongoing with an ongoing frequency. And they're going to want to look at your ratio ratios. How are you performing? Uh, are you still hitting your profitability? Is this in line with what their expectations are? Or are the return on inequity is it there? Uh, and if you don't meet some of those ratio requirements, they can call on the loan. So, so that, that is an important area that you need to understand uh, that you may have some restrictions entering into an, an additional loan. And it's good to know because there are alternative structures that you can take advantage of that do not have, do not, uh, they can obviate the need to uh, deal with that restriction. A very quick word about off balance sheet financing. You know, I'm, I'm here time and time again. Organizations, we want to do something that's off balance sheet. Why off balance sheet? Well, it's a financing term that basically uh, impacts the company's level of debt and liability. And uh, it by avoiding additional debt or be keeping it off balance sheet, that would improve your financial ratios. Again, that's part of what some of the lenders may be looking at. In terms of profitability, liquidity, uh, leverage debt to equity. Leverage is always an important word. We're going to use that. That word's going to come up again when we talk about the cash flow opportunity calculator and efficiency. You know, how are you efficient and using the dollars in your organization? Uh, when you keep it off the balance sheet, it can lower your, your borrowing costs. And as I mentioned earlier, it could avoid breaking levin, uh, lender covenants. But the Accounting Standards Board changed the rules many years ago, or maybe five, six years ago, by changing, creating a special asset right to use. So off balance sheet has become increasingly difficult to find structures that will in fact uh, comply with that request. But there are some energy structures that in fact will do that. And I'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, capital A lease, type A lease, Used to be a capital lease, uh, the pros, new credit lines, great structuring flexibility. This is really one of the benefits of using a lease where you can create a step lease, one that steps up as you install more equipment. As we know, uh, the more equipment that's installed, the more equipment that's being 
turned on, the more savings are being realized. And you can structure uh, some of the leases so that they reflect the actual savings that are being realized by the installation of the equipment. It does provide 100% financing under loans. Uh, they typically require a pretty substantial down payment. You can avoid that by doing a lease. And, uh, you know, it's treated very much like a, a regular loan. You can capture depreciation and interest investment tax credits, if any. And at the very end, the lessee or the borrower owns the asset. Uh, because it's structured only on by the asset that's being financed, the financing cost may be a little bit higher than a loan. As I mentioned before, the loan may the, the lender with a loan may have a blanket filing on all the assets of your organization. Very common. If that's the case, uh, you know that this this energy asset asset could be excluded, uh, depending on how you structure the financing. Uh, let's take a quick look at type B leases. They used to be called operating leases, as I had mentioned. They really don't exist anymore as true off balance sheet unless they are very carefully structured. Uh, again, structuring flexibility is there. In this case, if it does qualify as an operating lease or a tax lease, uh, the tax lease is one which it can be expensed for internal revenue purposes, but for financial reporting, it has to show up on the balance sheet. So even though uh, you can expense it, the tax lease, uh, for when you pay your taxes, it still has to pop up on your balance sheet when you do your financial reporting. So uh, FASB changed things considerably a number of years ago, and they've changed the panorama, making leasing uh, a little less common than before but still a great alternative to provide new funding sources, new dollars in ways that can be applied consistent with the energy savings that are being realized by your project. Very important distinction here is taxable versus tax exempt leases. If it's tax exempt, it means you, it's a lower interest rate. Why? Because no federal income tax is paid on the interest earned. Who can issue that? Public sector organizations can issue it. And the IRS ruling states that in order to qualify, you need to have powers of eminent domain, taxing powers, or police powers. Interestingly enough, there was a private university that had campus police that declared that they were qualified for public sector or tax exempt financing. Uh, these courts decided that the police powers were, there was constabulatory, they were not real police, and therefore, uh, the ability to issue tax exempt loan was canceled. What happened to the university? Well, the lender recalculated everything and they increased the payments that were owed by the entity to reflect the loss of their tax exempt status. So all the costs went up. Uh, private sector and large nonprofits can go through conduit agencies to issue tax exempt obligations. For example, a university in New York uh, could go through DASNY, which is the New York State. Uh, dormitory authority, and almost every state has an authority similar to this. Uh, so you can piggyback through that, that organization that is part of a qualifying entity, and uh, you would pay them a small fee to do that, but the interest rate is going to be lower, and typically the lower interest rate justifies paying that small fee. And as I mentioned before, public sector entities do not pay taxes, therefore they could not use tax incentives or strategies. Now that I think about it, thank you, IRA. I'm gonna to have to change this slide for the future because that is no longer exactly the case. Very quick mention of tax exempt lease purchase financing. I did talk about some of the benefits in the prior slide, pay lower interest rates. Uh, you have the same structure, flexibility with steps and skip lease. What's, what's a, a skip lease or a step lease? I shared going up as the equipment gets installed. A skip lease is one, uh, one for example, that we did for a uh, an organization. <coughs> excuse me, that was open in the winter, uh, open in the summer, and closed in the winter, so that the uh, payments were tied to when the cash flow was available for the entity or agency. Uh, so that they would pay higher when they had a lot of cash flow and lower during the off periods. Uh, 
they typically do not require a public referendum for approval. That's also a big uh, benefit of it. Uh, the true interest costs usually are lower than issuing a bond for small or medium sized projects. Plus, he always owns the asset at the end of the term. <coughs> Excuse me again. Uh, the, the, the big benefit here is the payment may be subject to the annual appropriation of funds. What does that mean? Uh, it's not considered debt because this basic agreement is treated as a year to year financing agreement. So if, the, if it's if your, your payments are not included in your annual appropriation, uh, it's the, the, the debt commitment or the financing commitment is over. It's, it's not a default. It's just over. What happens if it's over? Well, uh, you have to return the equipment. And uh, that can be obviously a pain in the neck. But because that is written into a lot of the agreements that uh, it is subject to annual appropriation of funds, the lenders who are willing to enter into these agreements will look for essential use of the asset. So uh, if, for example, lighting is part of the financing agreement, is that of essential use? Absolutely. Can't work in a dark room. Is a school cover part of essential use? No. It is not. However, if the pool cover is bundled in with a whole bunch of other activities, then the lender will probably approve the entire package. Uh, so uh, that one critical piece subject to annual appropriation keeps this funding financing agreement from being considered debt. It is not considered debt because the payment obligation ends at the end of your current operating period. That is very critical consideration. And this is the reason why most tax exempt organizations use this structure to finance these uh, energy efficiency improvements for their organizations. Energy service performance contracts, uh, one in which it's uh, service providing customers with a comprehensive set of energy efficiency, renewable energy, distributed district generation measures accompanied with guarantees that the savings produced by a project will be sufficient to finance the full cost of the project. This implies working with an energy service company or an ESCO. Uh, PRO, obviously, is if you need a guarantee in order to get approval within your organization, this is a really good way to go down that road. Uh, the, the, the project savings guarantee is normally part of these agreements. And if you're working with an energy service company, they do provide turnkey services. They'll provide you with comprehensive measures, uh, which is one of the reasons why they're looking for a larger projects. Uh, and uh, the energy service company can provide monitoring and verification, which again is very important to make sure that what's saving you today continues to save you into the future. Uh, the cons are uh, really limited only to understanding what you're signing up for. You need to do a very careful review of the contracts to ensure that you're getting only the services that you want and you need. And I think that's pretty consistent throughout most of the energy related financing structures. Only buy what you need and what you understand. Uh, energy services agreement. Again, uh, the equipment, these, these agreements, the equipment is owned and operated by the energy efficiency company and not the host. Uh, that's an important distinction because if you want to keep something off the balance sheet, uh, the assets go on the balance sheet of the owner of these pro of these assets. So if the host does not own the assets, the energy service company does, then they are the ones who can uh, capture a lot of the benefits, but they are also allowing the host to treat this as an operating expense. So pros, no upfront cost, project is managed and maintained by a third party. And again, off balance sheet, if that's a critical piece of it, this is something that is definitely worth taking a hard look at. Once again, careful review of contracts to make sure you're getting what you, only what you want, what you need. You've got a traditional ESA, one in which, excuse me, the equipment's owned by the ESCO, but the owner continues to pay the utility bills. A managed energy service agreements. It's one in which the utilities or bills are managed by an investment fund. 
uh, energy as a service, and these, this is becoming a, an increasingly popular structure. It's one that's been around for many, many years and used frequently in Europe, and it's only a relatively newcomer to the United States, but it includes equipment upgrades, replacements, managing bills, and suggesting alternative energy sources. A good example would be, uh, you know, we're going to commit to uh, working in a grocery store, for example. We're going to keep the refrigeration units at a constant temperature of uh, 38 degrees. Uh, th that could be an example of some of the contingencies in an ES uh, energy as a service. Of course, the assets are owned by a third party. Again, that means you would you potentially qualify for off balance sheet. An important note here about off balance sheet is that who decides if it's off or on balance sheet? Who decides? Your, your accountants and outside auditors, they're the ones who decide whether it is or is not on the balance sheet. So you need to bring them into some of these decisions if you're, if off balance sheet treatment is a critical consideration. And there's a, a new one, energy assets concession. Uh, this is much less common. It's a very long term. Uh, they provide substantial monies and it requires huge projects. These are multi million dollar, you know, 20 million, uh, excuse me. Uh, 50 million, 100 million, 200 million tolerant of projects. So, uh, unless you're in that category, that probably is not a structure that will work for you. Very uh, So, CPACE, uh, Properties Access to Clean Energy, financing mechanism that enables long, low cost, uh, long term funding. Uh, we've got, of course, uh, it's a voluntary program. Uh, it's an assessment on properties, regular tax bond, and process the same way as a local public benefits assessment would be, you know, for building sidewalks and skewer and sewers. Uh, it's a voluntary program. Uh, it does cover 100% of the project's hard and soft cost financing terms can extend out to 30 years, allowing very deep retrofits. Uh, it can be combined with in other incentive programs, which is good. And it may stay with the building upon sale. Now that's a very big plus. Uh, it's filed with the local municipality as a lien on the property, which uh, may be a, a bummer for some organizations, but uh, there is a definite a benefit to it being considered off balance sheet because it's tied to the property uh, and transfers with the property, therefore it may not be considered debt. And uh, it can stay with the building. Now, you want to sell your building and the new buyer does not wish to have that. Well, that could be, you know, paid off as part of the arrangement when, you, when the sale is consummated of that particular property. Uh, CONS requires state and local enabling legislation, which already exists in 38 states in D.C. Uh, it may require first mortgage approval. <laughs> Property assessments are paid once or twice a year. Unlike a loan, which you would make uh, maybe quarterly or monthly payments, and it's determined by the tax capacity of a particular property. Uh, tax capacity is uh, an interesting distinction because it's that's determined by uh, different organizations. Uh, hold on for a second. Just take that away. Sorry. Uh, and the interest rate may be higher than different alternative structures. Why? Because uh, it's a little more complicated uh, and, and, and accessing that. Where are their PACE programs? Uh, here's a map that was taken from PACENation.org, and you can see if the state you happen to be in, uh, if you do in fact to qualify. Power purchase agreements. Well, a power purchase agreement is a legal contract between an electric generator or provider and a power purchaser or the buyer. So basically, uh, they include hot water and electricity. <coughs> Excuse me. And it's typically used for renewable energy projects. I have to take a little sip of water now. So, pros minimal of any upfront costs. Uh, you have the potential to monetize tax incentives, which is maybe a little less important now, although it can be transferred over to the owner uh, under under the uh, IRA. Typically, long-term energy price 
is committed to, so you know what the price is going to be over a long period of time. Uh, there's no limited or limited operations or maintenance responsibilities, minimum risk to the to the host. The cons, the, con, uh, the contract, you have to contract to long term, uh, uh, long term, longer term. So you've got some limitations on your contract. Transactions costs are relatively higher than alternative structures. Uh, why? Because if a third party is going to uh, own the asset and, and be responsible for performance, uh, the engineering group and study that was done is going to be looked at again by the uh, the PPA company, the organization that's going to take on the responsibility of, of meeting uh, those obligations. Uh, the time to approve is a little longer because it has to go through some extra steps. Uh, politics to approve could be lengthy. Uh, the host cannot use the investment tax credits. Why? Because it goes to the owner of the asset. And uh, you know maybe some challenges with contract terms, conditions. In other words, uh, take or pay language, which may or may not be included in the document, which translates into uh, if if the savings do not realize to a point as promised, then uh, the host may be required to make a minimal payment as part of the contract. So again, you need to read through. Uh, okay. Seeing some questions popping up here. So, and I, uh, I, I prefer to answer the questions towards the end of the talk today, if you don't mind. So, uh, so there's an important list of what the next section is it's talking about pros and cons uh, over the financing structures that we just talked about and uh, some of the financing structures and how you can use them to address some of the pros and cons and hurdles that you need to deal with internally uh, when you're looking at proving uh, when you're looking at approving the uh, the project itself so uh, what are the typical hurdles that you run into with the new organization? You know, limited staff, uh, they're so busy doing other things, they don't have the time to look at a new project, they have limited expertise. You know, they're not in the energy efficiency business. Uh, it's too risky, you know, we're not sure if this is actually gonna work or perform. Uh, we have other priorities, you know, a strong economy. Everybody wants to generate income producing projects or work on, they wanna increase sales, they wanna increase income versus saving money. Uh, obviously in a, in a weaker economy, saving money becomes an increasingly important priority and it's just not our core business. So those are the traditional hurdles. Uh, some of the financial hurdles that you, I, I, we've run into, it's too expensive, we can get cheaper equipment somewhere else or we can get cheaper money somewhere else. Uh, we can't take on new debt as those nasty little existing bank covenants pop up again. Uh, we don't have the credit worthiness. You know, our market soft or financial performance is not as high as we'd like, we'd like it to be. You know, the return is too low. A lot of large organizations require very fast repay repayment. In a strong economy, income producing projects. Uh, we want something that's gonna pay for itself in three years is a very common hurdle in, in, corporate, in corporate America. Uh, Capital budget constraints. Now we don't have the money this year. We're going to have to wait until next year, or a future period. Or the payback is too long. It doesn't meet our investment thresholds. Again, three to five years. And energy efficiency frequently does not meet that threshold, but it does provide other alternatives. And number one being, it generates positive cash flow, and it allows you to use the energy savings realized through the installation to pay for the energy efficiency improvements that are being installed. So how do you use the different structures that I went over in order to uh, address some of these hurdles? Well, here's a list on the top, the different financing structures. We talked about loans, capital lease, power purchase agreement, uh, performance contracts, energy service agreements, PACE, et cetera. Uh, if you have limited staff, you know, none of the more traditional types of financing structures are going to be a bunch of assistance to you. However, when you get into working with an energy services company, 
and you're dealing with a power purchase agreement or a performance contract or an energy service agreement or an energy as a service agreement, et cetera, they can os offset a lot of these concerns that you have uh, with your operational limitations. Uh, PACE, not necessarily, but PACE is an, a good exp an opportunity for you to take advantage of if you're running into financial challenges. It's too expensive. Well, you don't want to spend uh, your money on it because it's just too expensive. Well, unfortunately, none of these are going to work for you. Uh, can't take on new credit. Uh, that is a problem. Uh, but again, you may be able to qualify under, you know, a, a, an operating or a tax type lease or a power purchase agreement or an, an energy as a service, for example, or a PACE. Uh, credit worthiness. Well, that's a that's a, a, a ticklish question here because you know everybody is concerned about how they're going to get their money repaid, and uh, PACE could be a really good opportunity for you to look at because the commitment is tied to the property itself. Although credit worthiness is never an invisible, it doesn't ever go away. Uh, PACE may provide you the biggest opportunity if that's if you're having some credit challenges. A uh, return is too low, power purchase agreement, uh, energy as a service, etc. As you can see, your capital budget constraints. If you are in a public sector organizations, you know a tax exempt lease purchase agreement is very good for uh, for, for capital budget restraints. Uh, payback is too long, as you can see here. I've X'd off the areas that you can uh, take a hard look at to see if, in fact, they're going to assist you in making uh, this project happen. Now, I'm just going to very quickly go over Energy Star financial tools. There are basically three of them that are downloadable uh, from the internet. Uh, the financial value calculator. This is a great tool that uh, ties the value of the improvements, the energy efficiency improvements to the uh, value of the property. And the world of commercial real estate properties get bought and sold based on earnings, uh, prevailing earnings ratios, and that will determine market value. So if you can increase the cash flow of the building, that will in fact increase the value of the property. A building upgrade value calculator. Well, this one is also very good, but it deals primarily with Another hurdle, which is split incentives. A lot of the projects when the building owner uh, is responsible for paying for the improvements, but he has tenants and they're not being metered individually who would receive the benefit of these upgrades. Uh, that can be a challenge to, to, to do it because the, the owner doesn't necessarily benefit. So if you use this tool, the building upgrade value calculator, it will walk you through different strategies that you can use in order to address directly the split and sense of barrier. You know, who pays, who benefits question of the improvements. And the third one is the cash flow opportunity calculator. It answers three questions. How much new energy efficiency equipment can be purchased? Some of the anticipated savings should be financed now. Are you better off to wait and see? <clears throat> use cash from the future budget. Or will we use money by waiting for a lower interest rate? A little more esoteric, but I've been able to use that very effectively out in the real world in the marketplace. I'll give you, I'll, I'll fill in the blanks when we get to that point. Uh, so what does this tool do? It helps you quantify the cost of delay. And uh, what I, if we were all in a room together, I'd ask you all to repeat this phrase out loud. You know, we are paying for energy efficiency projects, whether or not you do the project. What does that mean? Well, you can decide to not do the energy efficiency improvement project, which means you will continue to pay energy waste to the electric, gas, and water utilities. So you're going to continue paying the waste without receiving the benefits. So in essence, you're, you're losing out. Uh, so you're paying for it and not getting the benefit. Or you can go ahead and enter into the project and figure out a way so that the cash flows can cover the cost of doing the installation. So if you download the cash flow opportunity calculator from EPA web, from their website, it's an Excel spreadsheet. Open it up. This is the first 
this is the, this is the starter sheet that you'd see you can see on the bottom uh the different tabs traditional traditionally found found in an energy service uh, and an uh an excel spreadsheet and uh let's scoot in uh by the way there's a requirement to authorize enable macros because there are a lot of macros in here so you would need to uh authorize the macros before you would able to be able to use this so here's the first tab, the data entry tab. And uh, as you can see here, anything that's in yellow is an area that you can overwrite and enter your own data, uh, put your organization's name in here. And what we're trying to do here is assist the operational folks from commute, translating the energy savings which typically occurs in therms or kilowatt hours into dollars and cents so we can deal more effectively with the financial folks and, and when going through the budget process. So we understand that there are all kinds of types of projects uh, that can be used here or that you're presenting. So the first thing we need to do in addition to uh, entering the organization's name is decide how are we marketing our energy efficiency project to our client. Click on that button and it opens up this window, as you can see here, uh, user generated categories uh, using benchmark results from energy or APA's energy star portfolio manager, uh, green building categories. If you're using lead water, wastewater treatment, they don't measure things as cost per square foot. They measure a million gallons per day or per hour uh, energy efficiency type project, whether you're doing a building upgrade or tune up. Uh, manufacturing facilities, they measure things differently. They do it in widgets. So the presentations, the arguments that we're going to be using here are not unique to any one particular industry or any one type of project. It works for all organizations, be it public, private, or even a home, your personal home. The logic here is consistent across all categories, all types of customers. So let's help them quantify the cost of delay and the hope and the hopes of accelerating the installation. So I'm going to choose here, uh, for example, the benchmark results, because as I had mentioned earlier on, when we're dealing with uh, retrofit, capturing the benefits for retrofits, which is new under the term until the uh, Investment Recovery Act, uh, benchmarking is an acceptable methodology to figure out so your energy, uh, the energy use factor. So uh, when we look through here, we've got uh, sample values, or let me start here, name of the company which I've entered, type of analysis using benchmark results. That was our choice. You can click on sample values. Each one of these categories of analyses has sample values you can use just so you can get a chance to go in and play with the tool itself. And here we're using, of course, the portfolio manager category, 75 or better, 50, 74, low, below 25, et cetera. And this example, I'm assuming a million square feet and divided, as you can see here in the example, the annual energy costs or utility bill of $1.5 million, just divided accordingly. And what we're hoping to accomplish here is the savings targets through the energy efficiency improvements, 10%. It's always harder to save, generate more savings in an area that's already relatively efficient. And of course, the energy hogs, that's where the biggest opportunities may lie. Uh, in this case, we're using 40% for the example. What are we looking for here? We're looking for the total savings that we can pull out of uh, the uh, installation of the energy efficiency improvements. And in this example, it translates to 28% reduction in your utility bill. Uh, great. Now we know how much savings we have. How does that translate into financing? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to take that $425,000 uh, and we're going to leverage it. How do we leverage it? Well, we click on the next tab and we're going to plug it into our leverage calculator. So you can see at the top here, we're carrying forward all of the information that you just entered in the previous slide, previous tab. It's all the same, $1,500,000, five, dollars $425,000. But for us to leverage, we need to make some additional assumptions. We have to assume an interest rate 
and I'm going to assume in this case, an interest rate of 7%. I'm going to assume a year or term of 10 years. I'm going to allow 90% of the energy savings to be used for this particular project. And this does have some rebates or additional benefits of $100,000 in this example. So we plug that in. Now, this is probably more reflective of a commercial project. Uh, interest rates are going up considerably. Uh, so if you're looking at interest rates for commercial projects in today's market, could be anywhere from maybe 7%, could be even as high as 13%, depending on the size of the project and the credit quality of the borrower. But if you're dealing in the public sector, uh, that's probably going to be closer to 5%, you know, 4.5%, 5.5%, somewhere around there. So uh, you need to plug in those particulars to the ex expected funding that you're going to realize. And then you click on the calculate button over here. And it will tell you in this example, our savings of 425K will allow us to, in to install $2.8 million worth of new equipment without increasing the capital, without spending capital budget dollars. And we're not in, uh, and we're not increasing our operating budgets. We're actually re taking the money from our operating budget and hope that we can redirect those dollars to pay for the financing. Benefit is you can have your cake and eat it too. You don't have to take those other capital budget projects that may be sexier for your organization to enter into in terms of, uh, you know, increasing market share, et cetera. But if your organization happens to be a socially responsible organization and value energy efficiency improvements, of course, that's going to increase the value of doing these energy efficiency improvements to your overall organization. And the benefits can come back in terms of PR and, and advertising benefits. But be that as it may, in this example here, we got $2.8 million worth of equipment that can be installed without challenging our existing operating or capital budgets. Uh, the contribution to the operating budget in this example is $3 per square foot. Simple payback in this example, six years, eight months. Okay, now that we know how much we can pay for or how much we can buy, the next question is, well, are we going to uh, pay for it now and borrow money for it or, or pay financing charges for it? Or are we going to wait until the future capital budget? Now, I suspect if you're on the, if, if you're, uh, you've already heard this challenge, if you're out actually marketing some of these energy efficiency improvements. So do it now or do it later. If you do it later, you don't have to pay interest, but it has a cost, and the, the cost of delay, and that's exactly what we're going to be calculating now. So how do we calculate the cost of delay? Well, once again, as you can see here, the information from the earlier tabs are here, but we're introducing now a new area, oops, new area, which is the, how many years are we going to postpone the, the installation? Well, we don't want to do it now. We're going to wait until next year. If we wait until next year, project cost is going to go up. Uh, so it allows you to plug in whatever you estimate the project cost to go up. Energy costs could be going up. Uh, and costs could be going up uh, and, and uh, year, two, year two and three. And it could be different than year, year one next year. And at the request of um, uh, the University of Pennsylvania, they asked us to include uh, a variable so that if you cannot access, uh, for example, a school because the kids are in class and you cannot do the installation all in year one, and the energy savings have to pay for the project to allow for us to accommodate that. Very quickly, we're going to look at option A, which is fast track financing. And option B is, no, we're not going to pay any financing charge. We're going to wait for cash. So the question now becomes, which is a better financial decision? Now, this is can be a counterintuitive, counterintuitive uh, question here. So we're taking the savings, which we calculated in the first tab, total over project, total project cost. We're assuming a monthly pay payment. So it's 12 times the monthly payment, uh, annual cash flow, this minus this. And comparing that to uh, the option B, you don't do anything in the year one, the savings will go up because uh, the utility costs have, have changed. Uh, your project costs have gone up. 
you got to come up with a check with $2.7 million, but you're paying no interest. So you keep 100% of all of the future savings. So the question now becomes, which is a better financial decision? And I can guarantee you many of your financial people are not looking at it this way. They are not. Which is a better financial decision? Take the net present value of the cash flows. And as you can see here, the NPV of option A, $688,000 versus the NPV of option B, $400,000. Bingo. Uh, so you're better off to the tune of $284,000 by financing it now versus waiting for cash in a future budget. Uh, we presented this to a school district in the West Coast. They had a five-year build-out program. And when they looked at the cost of delaying for one year or two years, three years, four years, they decided they were going to install everything. And they parceled out the installation to get more people to install it faster so that they would save more money. The third tab, the third tab is, is really a little more esoteric. We can get cheaper money somewhere else. And that's true if you can get it on the same day, uh, take the cheaper money. But if you have to wait for it, then the cost of delay becomes part of the calculation again. So you take your net present value difference between your monthly payment of 7%, 4.5%. The benefit for entering into the cheaper loan is $342,000. And you put that here, and every month that you wait, you delay the installation, it's costing you money. This is the cost of delay. The break even point here, as you can see, is 9.7 months. So if this is the criteria that is specific to your case, if it takes you longer than 10 months to get your hands on the cheaper money, you're better off taking the higher interest rate. And that is counterintuitive, I can tell you, counterintuitive. So if people's budgets and earnings are based on cash flow, this is a critical component. You can generate the page, you can generate a report that restates all of the input that we did in that table. And here, where do you get this information? Go to the energystar.gov commercial buildings. Click on that. It opens this window, resource by topic. Get down to financing. Click on evaluate the economics. And you can click on, you'll find the a cash flow opportunity calculator. And there's additional information there. Uh, if you think that this tool is worthwhile, uh, if you look for uh, the calculations and methodology will spell it out for you. You can create your own spreadsheet and make it very specific to match the way you are marketing your energy efficiency improvements. Uh, there is another uh, download I would suggest that you read that expands upon how do you communicate the uh, to overcome the hurdles, be it uh, operational, financial to your organization, and download and that particular. Uh, document and uh, there's a lot of resources that are built into it. And I'm sorry, I, I pushed through a little bit fast towards the end there, but we're running out of time. So in order to leave a few minutes for Q&A, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to contact either me or Kudret. Oh, I see I have to change something there. Uh, sorry, I've, I've got Kudret's incorrect email address there. Uh, so I will change that, but at any rate, uh, feel free to reach out to me uh, if you have any potent case studies. We really are looking for case studies uh, to expand resources. You'll get this when you get the, the, the list. And uh, here you go. So let's open it up for questions. And again, I apologize, Kudret, for.